Good. Well, that's enough talking from me for a change. So I'm going to pass over now to um, John Teasdale, um, and he's going to go through the 2020 microlight uh, accident analysis. So over to you, John. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Um, good evening, everyone. I hope you're all fit and well, and I hope you've been able to uh, take use of this uh, settled weather we've had in order to uh, maintain your currency. Uh, now, part of my job with the BMAA is to uh, review and analyse the accident trends and then to liaise with the panel of examiners and the training committee to put in place measures in conjunction with yourselves, of course, to try to prevent similar accidents happening in the future. So I've recently carried out a, a review of the 2020 accidents, um, at least as published by, by the AAIB up until the end of January. And I thought it'd be useful to uh, share um, what my findings with you this evening. So we can see here on the first graph that uh, the number of accidents for 2020 was 36, uh, whereas in 2019, there were 39. And in 2018, um, there were 50. So the general trend is down, which is good. It's going the right way, certainly. Um, but I'm a little bit disappointed in the number given the, the loss of flying we've had due to COVID. We'll have a look at that in more detail a bit further on. The good news, of course, is that fatalities in 2020 were zero. Um, so that's something to uh, celebrate. Um, there have actually been zero fatalities in UK, UK registered microlites in the United Kingdom for three years now, although there were two fatalities to uh, G registered microlites abroad in 2019. Looking at the uh, control types now involved in the accidents, out of the uh, 36, there were 33 Axis aeroplanes involved and six weight shift. Now, this is fairly meaningless really because we all know that three axis are becoming far more popular now, but also we have no information on the relative number of hours flown by each type during the year. However, it's quite interesting to note that uh, five of these aircraft were SSDR. If we look at the causal factors now, there's a Typical pie graph here. It's uh, very little different to previous years, to be perfectly honest. Um, <clears throat> right, so working from the 12 o'clock position and working clockwise, we have three loss of control on takeoff. We have five engine failures after takeoff. We have six engine failures en route. Uh, 21 loss of control on landing, obviously by far the largest proportion. And then taking us back to the 12 o'clock position again, there's a single uh, case of mechanical failure during landing uh, where the undercarriage collapsed. Uh, we'll look at that in more detail a bit later. So if we look at the engine failures, of which there were 11, um, apart from one training accident, um, most of these landed safely um, with some aircraft damage, which was mainly due to nose legs being uh, bent over in soft fields. But it does look mainly as though the training uh, has actually worked. Two of these engine failures were due to pilot error. Um, one of them forgot to add oil to a two-stroke mix, and one simply mismanaged his fuel en route and uh, made a mess of things and ran out of, ran out of fuel altogether and had to make a forced landing. Um, as I said, apart from the training accident though, most of them landed okay with only minor injuries. There were two cases of uh, engine failure en route where there were mechanical implications and quite possibly maintenance implications uh, because in two of them, the uh, fuel pump, the Makuni fuel pump was found to have debris in it, which had caused the engine starvation. Uh, so there might be some maintenance issues there. However, the interesting thing is the common factor in all the engine failures were they were all two stroke engines.
Moving on to loss of control on takeoff. Um, this is fairly rare in my collects to have loss of control on takeoff, but we have three this year, which are quite significant. Uh, we're very lucky to not, have, not to have three fatalities as well. Uh, look, looking at the what, what actually happened, and uh, I think that all pilots were very lucky to uh, to get away with only minor injuries. So we have the first two, um, which are very similar. They're different aircraft and happening at completely different times at different airfields, but they're very similar accidents in that they were both caused by the aircraft pitching up abruptly on takeoff and taking the pilot by surprise. In both cases, they stalled a wing and crashed heavily. Uh, and wrongly trim is suspected to be the cause. You've heard uh, Fiona talk already about the changes we're making in the syllabus, um, and I'll talk more about it later as well. The third of the loss of control on takeoff accidents was a Savannah pilot who took off from a 220 metre farm strip. You may have seen the AAIB uh, report for this. Uh, this 220, farm, 220 metre farm strip uh, had six metre power cables at the end when the pilot operating handbook for the aircraft only gives 228 metres to clear a 15 metre object. Now the pilot in this accident claims that the flap lever jumped from uh, the normal takeoff position to 40 degrees, in other words, full landing flap, when he hit a bump during the takeoff run. Uh, the aircraft subsequently staggered into the air with a very poor climb rate. Um, he managed to uh, somehow get it over the wires at the end of the field, but then he thought one wing was stalling, and so he applied rudder in that direction. I have no idea why. Uh, clearly it's a control input error. Uh, this turned him away from the power lines and the, event the aircraft eventually crashed into a large pile of straw bales uh, from which the pilot escaped with only minor injuries. Uh, you can see from the, from the photograph there, he was very, very lucky to, uh, to uh, walk away from that with only very minor, inju minor injuries. Okay, moving on to loss of control on landing. Uh, as I said before, by far the largest proportion of the accidents and that is quite, uh, quite typical, really. Uh, again, rich in human factors here. Gusty conditions featured in five of these. And I'll speak more about that later. There are a significant number of nose legs, and this again is unusual for microlite accidents. Uh, bent nose legs following loss of control during landing, um, mostly due to a failure to control a pilot-induced oscillation. I do wonder if the, if the increased number of... Um, SEP instructors that are teaching on microlites now might be a, partly a cause for this. Failure, for, failure to go around from an unstable approach is common and uh, many accidents could have been prevented if the pilot had made an early decision to go around from an approach which had already gone wrong. Uh, some of the accidents really smack of skill fade uh, due to COVID or weather conditions or a combination of both. And two pilots actually admitted this in their accident reports. There was, as I said before, a single case of undercarriage mechanical failure. This was a, a weight shift aircraft, a main air blade, and the rear undercarriage drag link failed uh, on landing uh, due to an existing unnoticed uh, fatigue crack. So the BMA tech department have issued a reminder to owners of, the, of this aircraft to check this area as it is actually in the pilot operating handbook as part of the pre-flight inspection. Okay, moving on to the uh, conclusions from all this and recommendations. Um, we must celebrate, as I said earlier, another fatality free year, that's great news. Um, but as, as I said, the number of accidents is slightly disappointing really, when the reduced flying time due to COVID-19 is taken into account. Additional accidents due to skill fade are to be expected, um, although it is slightly disappointing because much effort has been directed at disseminating copious amounts of advice on websites and through videos and through uh, GASCO safety evenings in order to uh, advise pilots of uh, what measures to take to try and reduce the effect. Moving on to the human factors involved. Um, this year's um, 
the number of accidents due to human factors is uh, bang on normal, really. Uh, you can see on the slide here, it says that uh, in the syllabus, it says more than 70% of accidents involve human factors. This year's typical. You can see 26 out of 36, that's 72% in fact, we're down to pilot error or human factors. And so um, in, order, in order to reduce this number, where should we as instructors direct our efforts? Well, number one, I feel um, the land, a, a, number, a whole number of the whole raft of the accidents that happened on landing could have been prevented by pilots having better skills at handling particularly small and difficult strips. So typically pilots will learn to fly at large open airfields in fairly benign and uh, closely monitored conditions, but then we'll go um, and find, seek out more adventurous sites, particularly uh, private and farm strips, where there are surroundings causing turbulence and rotor for which they don't have the knowledge or skills to handle properly. And so the BMA strip, strip skills course is designed specifically to address this by further uh, post-license follow-on training. Um, despite um, pu pushing it quite strongly, um, only nine pilots have taken this up to date. And I would like all of you as instructors to try and promote this and um, sign up to, uh, get to delivering this training at your schools and offering it to your um, to your qualified pilots, uh, try to um, convince them that it's money well spent to um, take this training in order to have a to avoid having a broken aeroplane. So the second recommendation is going around. We must continue to push the message to go around unless everything is perfect on the approach, particularly if the touchdown point is going to be long into the runway. We've had several cases of um, aircraft going off the end of the runway where the touchdown point was too far down. And if they'd simply gone around and corrected the approach and put the aircraft down in the correct point, the accident could have been avoided. Recommendation number three is that we um, pay more attention to performance calculations. And you should be aware that these are now, of course, in the syllabus. And indeed, they are in the new um, ground examinations. So th there's an increasing number of performance related accidents where failure to properly consider takeoff distances or landing distances uh, can be seen to be a factor. And as microlized performance increases with the advent of 600 kilograms, this is going to become imperative. Um, I've already said more performance calculations are in the syllabus and the ground exams. And they are they're revised and further developed in the strip skills course. Number four, trim and flap settings. Um, again, you've, you've heard Fiona mention this earlier. Now, checking before takeoff, we've had several cases of pilots being taken by surprise by trim and stroke or flaps being set wrongly. So wrongly set trim and flaps and the ability, inability to deal with them after takeoff, mainly due to surprise, are causal factors in several accidents. So um, trim runaway was already in the syllabus, but wrongly set trim or flaps is now being added in the first review and reprint, which will be coming out uh, uh, any, any day now, actually. And uh, we are saying that that must be taught now so that hopefully pilots will not be taken by surprise. Uh, finally, understanding skill fade, we must push the message that uh, flying is not riding a bike and mental, mental capacity will be reduced after a period of uh, not flying. Situational awareness will be compromised and task saturation will cause mistakes such as infringements or accidents. So good planning is essential and should include threat and error management to reduce the chance of human error. Also, of course, keep it simple and uh, make those first flights really easy with no changes of altimeter setting, no, no changes of radio uh, frequencies. Um, just as somebody once said uh, quite recently, just get airborne and remind yourself what it feels like to wear the aeroplane. All right. So that's all for me. Thank you very much.
I'll hand back to Jeff and in turn to Aaron. <laughs>